take one part vocal essence, two parts creativity, blend it all together with a bit of alchemy, and you're ready for the Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity, and coated with sarcasm. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me this week is Mike Kafis. Jack Ballard. Hello. And our guest this week, Dave Robeson. Hola! <laughs> Dave is an avid literary and vocal alchemist who pursues a wide range of creative explorations. A brainstormer, keeper of the buttery man voice, pattern seeker, <laughs> dream weaver, and eternal optimist. He is currently shepherding two projects in the world, our Chivos, I think that's how it's pronounced, uh, a story mapping and presentation tool, and Manifest, a board game combining the positional strategy of chess with the fantastical diversity of Magic the Gathering. Sounds oh, awesome, cool. and I cannot wait to get into all this. Dave, welcome to the Mythwits. Dude, thank you so much. I am I am honored and, and slightly sullied at the same time. I don't know how that's possible, uh, and, and yet you guys have achieved that. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Right, it's like putting that's, a, that, that's our goal. big pedestal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, sullying is definitely our cup of tea. So is that yeah. your vibe? Is that is that your groove? Yeah. Your jam? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, in our if, wheelhouse. At least. Right, if if we were if we were uh, Monsters Incorporated, we'd be Sully. Yeah. So <laughs> so yeah. So Dave, I got you know. Uh, first off, right, first off, hey everybody, we're back. Uh, for good or ill, mostly ill, as as you can guess, uh, we had a, we took a month off. Uh, Balticon was our last thing that we did. Uh, recorded so much stuff. I've been working my butt off trying to catch up on the podcast, but I'm almost there. I got one more thing to put up. Um, but yeah, I got got a bunch of stuff up. Dave was part of one of those things. Yeah, uh, I played a Frenchman. I played a lot of Frenchman. Yes, he did. <laughs> it was awesome uh, but, too. But we were uh, we were talking to Dave and um, you know and, and made good buddies with him, uh, and then I found out he posted something on Facebook and um, I was looking at it. I was like, oh my god, that looks really really cool. So I was like, hey dude, I got a spot. Why don't you come on? So he is our he is our uh, mid season premiere opener, uh, and we're we're damn happy to have him. Uh, Dave, you got so much so much going on we're gonna we're basically gonna skim over a lot of it and we're gonna focus we're gonna gonna focus on the on the big stuff so uh, i could go on i could probably talk to dave on this show for uh i don't know maybe four or five hours with all the shit that he does (laughs) (laughs) he's a busy dude so so anyway so dave dave welcome um thank you i think the the first thing i want to touch on uh is you were kind of uh, basically born to do what you're doing it seems like because uh, I, I was reading your bio uh, and, and from a little kid you were ready to go with with being creative and doing doing what you do uh, one of the things that, and I want I want to touch on this specifically uh, curious George and Paddington bear fan funk fiction to t- oh, t- wow. tell me about that. <laughs> Yeah. If it was Gonzo, I'd be really excited. But go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, it, did, it didn't go Gonzo. Gonzo wasn't a thing when I was writing this because this was this would be back in the like the seventies. They didn't know they didn't know Gonzo yet. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I I you know as a kid, uh, my mother was a teacher first and foremost. So she's gonna she's gonna rock the the reading, the the culture, the whole thing. She was a strong advocate, making sure that I was at least exposed to as many things as I possibly could be. And part of that, of course, was reading. And so there was a Babar, there was Curious George, there was Paddington Bear. I loved all these things. I honestly don't know what got into my head that I thought, for some bizarre reason, that I could write my own story. But I did. I wrote a Paddington Bear short fiction piece where he went on a uh, went to a museum, and and through happenstance and shenanigans. Uh, destroyed one of the bone, one of the one of the skeletons of the dinosaurs, and at the end, one of the bones was in his room or something like that. I forget the the searing drama of it all. It was an epic, sweeping tale. Not a dry eye in the house by the time we were done. Uh, but I'm typing this thing up on my mom's Smith Corona, you know, wow. clack, 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 clack. Mm-hmm. and and I remember I was at uh, my grandparents had a place on Long Beach Island on the shore, Jersey Shore. 
And I remember typing it up and presenting like all eight pages or whatever it was. Uh, uh, I, I must have been like eight years old. I don't know. And, and handing it to my parents who were playing bridge out on the patio. And, oh, my God, it's, it's like the second coming of Christ. Oh, <laughs> look at this wonderful thing that our child has wrought. Yeah. <laughs> every child, every, every parent knows their child creates awesomeness. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that first, that first rush of writing a story, finishing the story, and then the, the accolades that came thereafter – uh, I think that really kind of threw a switch for me because right after that, I started getting into theater yeah. uh, and theater has been a part of my life ever since then, from the time I was 10 or 11 uh, uh, up until just a few years ago. Well, hell, when you get right down to it, audio fiction and, and uh, sure. narration is a kind of acting, right? Yeah, right. So, sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we we so did some I'm, theater at Balticama, man. Damn strippy, damn skippy, yeah, some yeah. good theater too. Yeah, uh, got to do a couple of things. So, so yeah, that was that was my start, Paddington Bear, and and Curious George fan fiction. Yep. The, now there's wow. no chance that you still have any of that, or your parents still <laughs> have any of that, do they? <laughs> there, Unreleased. there are unreleased unreleased yes yes, yes. the trunk novel uh, as you have heard so many times from writers in the past. I have so many folders and boxes and stuff secreted away in little cubby holes all over my house. It's entirely possible that there's some time capsule of awesomeness that will take me back to my preteen writing years and I'll find something like that. But at this point in time, Peter, no, at this time, there's no fucking way. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny. I didn't I didn't really start doing a whole lot of that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I used to draw a lot. I used to like to draw. I thought I was going to be a comic book artist when I was a kid. And um, I used to draw all these sketches all the time, all over everything, like my notebooks, my school notebooks. I still have a couple of my old school notebooks. And if you look at them, every page has got a drawing of something on it, right? Which uh, instead of going into engineering, maybe I should have gone into art, but it didn't happen that way. Um, but Never I too remember, late, man. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. Hey, I'm being creative. This is my this is my outlet, and I'm very happy <laughs> with go. it. Uh, if my, he's uh, doing this, it really speaks to the drawing skills. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> That's harsh, brother. That's harsh, man. <laughs> if this is the best you got, you better put those drawings away. That's it. <laughs> you know what I should do? I should. I have. I have a bunch of those. I should. I was going through a bunch of my shit the other day. You know, throwing out stuff and and going through my. I have these boxes of memorabilia stuff. I keep certain things from certain i don't know just certain things that that mean something to me and then every i don't know five to ten years i'll go through these boxes and the shit that i can't remember i throw out you know like i i, 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 I know i saved this i have no idea why i saved this so i throw it out uh it's but, my but it's writing really, but i have no idea right who wrote that shit right right and um but i mean it's all kinds of stuff i mean it's like i have old zippos and stuff but you know, and it's nice to go through the box. I mean, it really takes you back. You hold one of those items from your past, and it just, like, sends you right back yeah, to that moment. Yeah. It's fantastic. But I found yeah. these comics that I did. I, I used to do these, uh, like, on a, you know, like on notebook paper in class. I would do comics. I made this comic book. I had this series. It was called Super Gumby. So that's how creative it was. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I found a bunch of them. And um, I should post some of those. They are horrible. But, I mean, you know, it's it's where I was, you know, and, and it was it was fun, and I liked to do Doing them. I mean, it wasn't serious. Those, those seeds, those those bri brilliant first moments where you actually step out and start making something on your own. That's important stuff, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. And then That's there was true. the letter. I, I we had a friend of ours, and this is horrible. I mean, this this I was there was something wrong with me. I swear to God, something yes. wrong with me in high school. <laughs> no, no. I mean, really, really. Uh, I my Let friends. Out. Yeah, that's it. My friend Let locked his out. cat in the attic by accident. And I wrote a and the poor the poor cat died. You know, nowadays I would never make fun of that. But back then, as a teenager, you know, it was just stupid. There's something wrong with me. Uh, I wrote a poem from the cat to to my friend, and it is really fucked up. It's Mike D's oh, cat, yeah. dude. <laughs> yeah, was, I, never, I never. As, story, like, so as I'm dying in the attic, this is my <laughs> this is my final word. Oh, yes. yes, you're a beast. I know, you're a monster. I know. You're you're not wrong. You are not wrong. It was. It was. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> It was terrible. Hey, it was terrible. Pete Pete has always been able to uh, draw from the, uh, the the vibes of a dying cat in an attic. That's always been something he could draw like a from. Superpower. You know? yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not a good power, but it is my power. No. <laughs> so anyway, I, that's terrible. I, it really is. It's bad. I feel I, I, to this day I feel bad. Poor poor Mike. But you know. Do you feel better letting that out though and sharing that with the whole world for all eternity yeah. on the internet? Yeah. I don't know. Sure. Yes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> 
tell me about your mother. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right, right. Talk. <laughs> talk, yeah. And I would share that, but it is so messed up. I don't want anyone seeing that. I don't think. Maybe I did. I because if there's. It. Actually, I think I did share it. <laughs> Wait, if there's was... one place, if there's one place that is just non-judgmental, it's the internet. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Because yeah, yeah. your secret is safe with us. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> just, just, just between you and me. Right. Yeah. So, so anyway, so, so Dave, back, back to Dave. Enough about me. <laughs> back to Dave. Um, so, so you went on. I mean, like, it seems like. I mean, you're, you're an older gentleman like us, much like us, somewhere in our age range. Um, so you've had a life of, of storytelling and world building and creativity and stuff. What are some of the things before we get to, to where you are today? What are some of the things that you've that you've created? Uh, and I'm, I'm really especially interested in things that um, I mean, you don't have to go through the whole list. Just, you know, some things yeah. that stick out. Things that you've created that you thought were going to be awesome because this is always the best. This is, you know, we think <laughs> we're creating the next fucking great thing that's going to, you know, the next greatest thing ever. And then we get into it and we're like. Oh, this is why nobody's done this. Have you had, have you had any of those? <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Uh, you know, honestly, the, the opportunity to, to put something out in the world uh, uh, in, in some significant way that didn't involve some massive outlay of cash and production really didn't come into existence until like, 2000. You know, so like in the last 20 years, the opportunities for self-publishing, for getting content out the Internet, blah, blah, blah. Um, so prior to that, not so much. There, there, there weren't a whole lot of I'm trying to think. God, that's a great question. I'm sure I'm sure there's something back there that I assumed was just as great as sliced bread, if not better. Right. I did do back in 2003. Uh, my wife and I started up a nonprofit radio theater company called Rabbit Hole Radio Theater. Hmm. Uh, and uh, we, we actually connected with the local uh, public radio station and they agreed to air our episodes once a week. Uh, and we got together with the local theater company and we created writing groups and we held auditions uh, and we recorded, uh, by the time we were done, we recorded thir three 13 episode seasons of audio drama, original audio drama. Oh, nice. It's a freaking blast. It was amazing. Incredible. I don't know if you guys have ever gotten into gotten into audio production at all, audio drama, the actual creation no. from beginning to end. Not drama, no. Shows like this. No. But no. Still like this, sure. And and there is a certain leisure of satisfaction when you get the intro and the outro and the sound bites and the levels and oh, that yeah, yeah, yeah. just right. And you put it out, it's like, yes. If you write a script and then record people reading your words and then record the sound effects that make those words sound like they're happening in a world and then underlay music underneath that, put in intro and outro and all of that, you put that together you feel like freaking God. It is an amazing experience. I cannot describe wow. that feeling of achievement and satisfaction when something that didn't exist, you know, a month or two ago is suddenly this thing that people can dig. Yeah, so, I, yeah, you know what, though? I, kind of, kind of, you know what? I, I think I can sympathize, or not sympathize. I think I can, what? Uh, 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 empathize. Empathize. Empathize with you? I guess that's the word. Um, that's the word. I did do uh, so. Cuba Death is a is a is a game that I've made, uh, but we did a Cuba Death podcast and we did a, a season of it, and um, it's a game show. So we have contestants come on and they play, but there's a story. So it's it's like there's this it's like an adventure, but it's a story. And when they when the when the players it's like a say imagine a D and D dungeon, right? So I write mm -hmm. up every room in this dungeon, and the and the like the game master runs the people through this thing, and then when they when they make it when they come to an encounter. They have to answer a question, right? It's a trivia question. If they get the question right, they defeat whatever's in the room. If they get the question wrong, they take damage, and they're playing characters, and they have special abilities. So the whole adventure is scripted out, but there is a, a random a randomness to it as the players chime in and they do their part. Uh, and then with that, I put in, in post, I put in sound effects, and I put in a bed of music behind it, intro and exit, and it was a story. You know, it was written like a story. So it was kind of it was, it was similar. It was, it was Absolutely. Yeah. I would dude, say that, that qualifies, actually. Yeah, I, would I would say right? absolutely that qualifies. And that sounds fabulous, man. Seriously, yeah, I, I, can see, I can see why you did that. That's got legs. 
Yeah, it was cool. <laughs> uh, we're going to be doing more of it, but uh, but not right awesome. now because I'm so busy. Because <laughs> that takes up uh, time, right, Dave? You think yeah. it takes up a little oh, bit of time? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, there, <laughs> there's no doubt. There's Your life becomes consumed by whatever that project is. Believe it. Yeah, mm -hmm. no doubt. So so all this stuff, all this creativity and stuff uh, led you into role playing, obviously, because, you know, all I think all creative, all really creative people eventually get there at some point somehow. All roads yeah. lead to role play. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so did you did you role play as a youth or did you pick that up later or was that uh, is, is oh, that no, something this was, still this do, was high school, baby? This was yeah. uh, uh, there was a guy in my French class. I remember it very clearly. Um Dude in my French class was pumped about this thing that he found. It was amazing. And and he whips out of his, his book bag the, the player's handbook. This is first edition AD and D player's handbook with the thieves. You've got it, right? You no, mean, no, 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 no. Go back a generation. Oh, yeah, no, Go I got back this, a generation. This this is AD and D, but it's um it's the second printing. I don't have the first printing. Yeah, but it is yeah. This is the one with the, the thieves prying the jewels yes. out of the idol's eye. Yes, okay? I, I know. Was, I don't, oh, I don't yeah. have that one. You know <laughs> what I'm talking about. So he yeah. throws this in my face and this is amazing. And then some of my theater buddies, uh, we, were doing, uh, we were doing a high school version of Shakespeare in the Park in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Wrap nice. your head around that for a second. Oh, yeah. man. That sounds yeah. nice. High schoolers doing Shakespeare in the Park in Cheyenne, Wyoming. All right. <laughs> Some of my buddies in there had gotten into D and D, and they were talking about their adventures. And you guys, you guys all think back when the first time you heard somebody else play talking about their D and D game. It's like, what are you yes. doing? That sounds awesome! Yeah. And instantly, you ingratiate yourself and force yourself into the experience, which is what I did, and yeah. uh, never looked back. This was—I must have been, God, I guess, sixteen, seventeen at the time, yeah. and uh, rode that rode that horse all the way through college. Uh, well into well into young adulthood uh, until, as we all found, life got too busy to yeah. set up regular games anymore. Uh, right, right. I still manage. I have a weekly group. I still manage to game with them, but it's it's not the easiest thing in the world. There, are, it, I got a question. We're all gamers on this call, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, is there anybody on here who hasn't come up with their own homebrew role playing game system? Dead uh, silent. Every I, single one of you well, has I don't tried. Think, right? I don't know. Mike, I, I, Mike I'm wasn't... an enabler. I enable Pete. He does it, and I am I like to think of myself as <laughs> long for his ride on his project. And Pete's I think I make contributions awesome. yeah. like a creative adjacent. But, yeah. so Creative Jack, adjacent. <laughs> yeah, and and Jack, Jack plays, but you're not – you weren't like hardcore like the rest of us, right? No, I was um, – I'm a little bit younger than all you old farts. So uh, I was more into uh, PC gaming. And I, I was very – I grew up very isolated. So there wasn't five guys in my town that played D&D. &D. So my first, uh, my first foray in the role playing was like Might and Magic on my uh, IBM computer in like 1986. Like that yeah. was, you know, that was my first, I, there was no, you know, I grew up in, in the middle of a cornfield, so there wasn't a whole lot there. Um, but yeah, but I, I could definitely relate. I've created music um, and recorded music. And, and when you were talking about that, going from it not existing to being something beautiful that exists in the world, there's nothing like giving birth to something like that. That's of your own creation. There's nothing quite like it. Hell yeah. yeah. Hell Jack, yeah. Jack, Jack had an IBDM. <laughs> What? I, what? His, his computer was his DM, taking oh, okay, him right. on I got you. Ah, adventures. Got so he had yes. IBDM. Right. Got gotcha. You. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I will say this, Dave. I make up for the other two. I have I have been making games since 1981. So like I played D and D, and within a year I was already making my own game. It was terrible, but I was of course making it was, them. and I made <laughs> a ton of them. Is. Dude, I made a space game. I made a, a, a superhero game. I made uh, I made a generic game back before there was any such thing. I made this this game. I called it the game, and you could play anything, anytime, anywhere. Um, I, I made one that was uh, was based in hell, or no purgatory. It was a kind of a purgatory where dead soldiers went. So everybody in the game was a soldier from a different time zone. I, I mean, fuck, wow. dude. Every time I turned around, I was making a new game. I made a game from people in Atlantis. I made an Oriental Adventures type game, and and these were all their own games, their own rules. Most of them were horrible, but <laughs> but yeah. The, I've, the I've Oriental Advance, the Oriental game had a very nice ending, a, a happy ending, I think. 
That's, yes, Delicious. it did. What? It was a happy ending. Yeah. Really? <laughs> For me, a happy ending. Yes. Go figure. Was, See, it's very... interesting to me, though. It's interesting because every a, a lot of people, anybody that got behind the DM screen, and not everybody's motivated to get behind the DM screen. Right. But anybody who is, I would bet that 95% of those individuals have all gone out and either created their own role-playing game or certainly created their own adventures. There's right. something incredibly empowering yeah. about the role-playing game experience that actually fosters, I think it's because you're working with a very intimate and safe group. Your playing group is your buds, your chums. You trust them, you game with them. So you can try something that will suck and you won't be, you know, you won't lose anything other than maybe some, some, some dignity as your friends razz you, but nothing's really at stake. But we all are driven to create something, to tell a unique story, to, to put our unique voice into that TSR experience or Wizards of the Coast experience or, yeah. you know, Monty yeah. Cook, whatever. We want to be a part of that chorus. And, that, yes. and the way we do that is by creating stuff and making our own stuff. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's, yeah. and when people say, well, I, and I, I see a lot of times, you know, because there's so many games out there. There's, I mean, there's so many games out there. People say, why do we need another game? It's like, why don't we need another game? God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> like, Fuck you. I'm going to make another game. Because that's what funny. I do. Because <laughs> mine's going to be better. <laughs> right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And, and even if it isn't, even if right. it isn't, and here's, here's something that we learned from the, from the, from the, writer's community there is no such thing as bad writing right there's no right. such thing as creating a bad game right it, okay it might be a bad game it might be a bad story but you learn so much you experience so much and acquired uh that much more chutzpah and panache and credentials in your own heart that you made that thing that that counts man that gives you that puts a spring in your step and opens up doors and opportunities yeah. Yeah. absolutely well, you know, let's let's get on with it then. We're we're talking games and <laughs> and and writing and creating and stuff. And you have you sir are working on something very very cool. Uh, it's our is it archivos or our our please pronounce that for they, me. They they told me this was going to be a problem, <laughs> and it's true. It is. It's I I call it archivos. Archivos. Okay, archivos. that's good. Yep, I like that. Like yep. Archive. Right. Archivos. Archivos. Okay. So yeah. that's what I call it. But honestly, you know, call it Archivos. If that is that, if that's your jam, <laughs> call it Archivos. Just remember A R C H I V O S dot digital. Just remember that, and you can call it Archivios as much as you want. I don't care. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, and, and everybody, the link, it, we're going to put the links in at the end of the show, but if you want to go look at it, it's right, right there. Right. right uh, there. Dude, you're so, awesome. You Thank yeah. you. Yeah. It's all, it'll already be there. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now this this looks really cool. And dude, I was reading up on this. I was reading up on on it as much as I could because you guys are not, you know, you're not ready to release a whole lot of information on just yet, other than you know what what you're gonna release tonight. But um, but from what I could gather, because I signed up for the mailing list, this thing is is gonna be a lot of what I've been looking for that I could not find. Because um, I do, like I said, create our yeah. own games. I have a game and and. Being that I'm working with TS, the new TSR games now, um, I may I haven't I haven't finalized this or set this up with them just yet, but it's 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 very probable that I may be releasing a role playing game through them. Uh, I, it's me. it's mostly designed. Yes, I have a oh go ahead. I, you were talking and talking. I thought I wanted to get to what Ar Archivos is, but go ahead. Okay, I'm going to. I, I am. I, I'm, I'm dying to know about that. Yes, dude, I, I, yes. dude, I'm Hold getting on. there. I'm getting. I'm setting this up. <laughs> building Jesus. the tension. I'm yeah. building it. I can't, Jesus. I can't wait. Hurry up. Stop. People gotta have something to pin it to. I'm giving him some. I'm giving him some clay to pin it to for people to wrap their minds around. Context. Okay? Context. Context. So I have this thing I've been working on, and there are tools within our archivos that um, that I think I could use. Uh, especially with maps, because it was, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do is have a map that people could zoom in on, uh, and that the resolution would would then get better. It wouldn't just be this one static image as you zoomed in. Then it would the way Google Maps does, and that's one of the things I saw that it picks up. So, so tell me, let's let's get started with with the maps. And what I'm going to do, Dave, I'm going to share. Uh, I am going to share my screen. I got this all set up. I am going to share a. Uh, uh, there we go. Um, the screen 
And ah, we'll the to, timeline. Hold on, wait. We'll go first. Let's go to let's go to the map. We're talking about the map. <laughs> of course. So, he, so here's the map. Let, let's talk about this. So how does this work? Tell me about this interface. So Archivos is a tool that that writers and game designers will use, right? Uh, and That's then I'm gonna the leave hope. it off to you. You go. You go. Me shut right. up. You talk. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> <laughs> Archivos is a, a story mapping and development and presentation tool. Uh, ah. It's designed to allow storytellers, and I use that term with capital S and and you know little flutes and and full work around the side because honestly, storytellers are, as far as I'm concerned, the the the, the champions of the universe. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, I think we're all storytellers on some level or another, which kind of makes yeah. me think everybody's a champion, and they are. Um, but the idea is that storytellers can document all of the story elements in their story settings or their game worlds or whatever. So all the characters, all of the organizations, all the regions and locations, the items, the disciplines, the races, all of these things have a, a designation. Uh, uh, they're, they're basically a story element type. Based on that type, then they can add more information, descriptions, images, so on and so forth. Part of that defining of that story element profile is defining the relationship between that element and the other elements in the story. And that's the real strength, I think, of Archivos. And that is really the meaning, that's where the meaning and the, the, the impact of any story setting or game setting comes out. It's not in the characters, the places, but how they interconnect, how they engage with each other, whether they're allies or adversaries, what's their history. Um, so you define those connections between characters and locations and events and items. And then once you have all that done, Archivos provides you three unique display modes that you can see those interactions with. And the one we're looking at right here is called the living map. This is designed to illustrate the geographical interconnections between all of the story elements. So as you can see down the left-hand side, there's this display of all of the different maps that are currently available. And basically when you create a map, you create a story element for Middle Earth, we're using Lord of the Rings here, that is a region. And in the region story element type, you can upload a map for that. And that then becomes the map that can be displayed when people look at Middle Earth. Then you can go in and take other story elements like uh, Helm's Deep, like Mordor, like Mirkwood, so on and so forth, create story elements for them and then click and link them to that map. That coordinate where they exist there is now marked for Mordor or, or the Shire or whatever. And then once that's done, then people, anybody else, you or anyone else, when they call up the map, will see that hotspot that says, oh, what's that? That's Mordor. Click on it. And boom, you can see on the right-hand side, there's a brief description of Mordor uh, uh, and also the opportunity to see a full profile of Mordor and also all of the other story elements that are linked to Mordor in some way, shape, or form. So with a, in a single view, with a single glance, you can see dozens of interconnections laid out for you in, in, in a quick, you know, a few seconds of analysis and you can see the connections between these elements. Uh, and, and I agree. The living map is one of my favorites. Oh my God. That nice. uh, honestly, all of them blow my mind, but I'm a world builder from way back. Uh, and when I was putting this thing together, it's like, Oh hell, we got to have a map thing. Uh, yeah. and so this would work for, for certainly story worlds, but also definitely gaming worlds. Yeah. And you don't have to go with just country maps. You can bring a city map in there, you know, water deep, bam, put a water meat deep thing up there. And then for your campaign, you can mark, all of your own unique little taverns and where does this guild live and blah, blah, blah. All of that stuff is defined and then your players can look at it, click, click, boom, boom, and away you go. Bob's your uncle. Right. Wow. And it, it could, something you could do, like I'm, we're playing a game, let's say we're doing a campaign. Let's say we're playing in Middle Earth, we're playing Middle Earth just because we have this map. And uh, we're doing this campaign and we've got a whole bunch of little markers on here as we've been playing, right? And I go, what the hell did we do up here in the Brownlands? And there's, because there's a marker there and you can click on it and go, oh yeah, that's right. That's where we killed that giant bear thing, right? And because that's, that's an element that you could add in there. And you, or you could say, uh, is this something where you could also say um, you go down to the elements uh, or, or you could 
could you look up say uh, where have we seen orcs and you could click on orcs and if you've managed if you've populated your map where every place you've seen orcs would they all pop up as like oh this is all the places we've seen orcs that's what the search box in the upper right hand corner oh, is for see, wow. damn it i love this <laughs> if you want to see all the places that's associated with Frodo, you enter Frodo's name up there, bam, the screen filters, and there's Frodo stuff. You, if, as long as you created a story element for the race orcs and then created the events that were the various dungeons or battles and you linked orcs to those events and so on, then when you type orcs up there, there you go. Wow. Oh, all right. God damn it. I got a question. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. It, it, is a lot of the backbone or the the in inside uh, guts of of this uh, of your software? Is it basically like visual relationship mapping? Is that a big Very part of it? So. Very much. So. Okay. Uh, because honestly, when I looked I, at this, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Oh, uh, I was gonna say when I when I was looking at this and I I was like, wow, there's this very much seems like it is and uh i am fascinated by by the, the that that type of software i think it's going to be big in um all you know uh in the next generation of computer programming and all that kind of stuff it's sort of a visual relationship um thing and the fact that you are able to like you were saying look at one thing and see all the other aspects related i think that this in, in and of itself probably could be a tool that could very easily be developed for, you know, write book writers who want to keep track of all their plots and plot, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. um, arcs and things like that. And I just think that, first of all, this is just amazing. And uh, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Well, now take this a yeah. step further. You know, we're yeah. talking about fiction. We're talking about gaming. And that's definitely with phase one Archivos. We're totally focusing on that demographic. That's that's the yeah, industries yeah. we want to serve. But. Shakespeare is just a story. Steinbeck is just a story. You can load classic literature into this stuff. Yep. And then have educators of high school or up to the college level and beyond using it as a resourcing tool for information about those story settings. Plus, oh, oh, history, history is just a story that actually happened. So we can put oh, yeah. you know, the Civil War into Archivos. We can put yeah. the Renaissance into Archivos, and we can use it as either a God, I love the Renaissance, or an educational tool uh, to to share with people certain perspective and views of various elements of history and culture. Dave, th think about oh. this. Look, think about this as, and <laughs> God damn it, I have to say this because I work for the Army, right? I, it, it, so my mind is a work is a you know like we we do prototypes for the military, so. I'm I'm always like coming up with shit for 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 the for the the soldiers and stuff. But I'm, this could be a, this could be a fantastic military tool. Um, you know, our soldiers win here. This is a map of Iraq and track all the shit that happened. And you've got everything laid out in front of you. These units moved here on this day. They got pushed back here. They, we've seen the enemy move here, here, and here. Oh shit! I'm starting to see a pattern of where these guys might be. Now I don't know if yes. they have software like that already. They may, right? I would imagine, but it ain't as cool as this. But but yeah, right. But but I don't I don't know that you know. I mean, but it's something that you know. Working where I work, I may I may try and find an opportunity to bring this bring this in because this Dude, is cool. I would be deeply grateful if that happened. And and really, you know, that really was kind of the reason why I was driven because clearly I, I've been working on this thing in various states and and levels for probably over a decade now. Uh, I've got friends at jobs that I've forgotten the address to who are tired of me talking about it on the lunch breaks. Uh, we could do this. It'd be awesome. Um, but hey Mike, really, what does that sound like? Uh, a lot of people I know, but you in particular. You're right. <laughs> we, we are brothers from another mother, Peter. So, no doubt so guilty. about it, man. So guilty. <laughs> but the, the, the idea, the ability to... You know, as you were saying, Mike, talking about the, the connections yeah. between those things, seeing that conceptual map and the awareness and the insight that comes from seeing that visual, that, that visual configuration of ideas and thoughts and, and structures, I, I think that's incredibly illuminating for people. I think switches start getting thrown when you start seeing how things fit together, what that progression is. Peter, go ahead and call up the uh, the the timeline if you would. Yep, we'll do. Uh, oh, and timeline. while all right, so while he's pulling that up, 
Uh, I, just so you know, Dave, I have um, uh, a, someone in the chat room named Ray Noor who says that uh, he is, can't wait for this to come out so that he can use it because he's got something published. Uh, he said, I plan to use Archivos to develop my campaign setting once it's released. And uh, it just got picked up for publishing. And that is uh, Ray Noor. Uh, the Borderlands published by Storm Bunny Studios. Jesus, so dude, you got, you got the you got, Bloodlands published by, and it's Sean Cortego. <laughs> Raynor, <laughs> somewhere, somewhere around here is going to be my email address. Right. Email my ass, uh, yes. and let's talk because that is exactly the uh, you know, development and building and creating. Definitely. Archivos is a huge tool to be a great asset for people at that stage. But once you've published something and put it out there, you know, like Lord of the Rings or, or your adventure game world or whatever. The cool thing is, is that all of these story views, when you as a storyteller, you know, you get your subscription to Archivos, you build your story setting. You can set that to private and it's just you. No one else sees it. You can use it for yourself and you give that, you know, personal creative spark. But you can also set it to public. And yeah. on the Archivos website, when it goes live, people are going to be able to see your story setting, see these three pillars, these three display modes for your story setting. Jeez. There's even going to be like a Netflix display thing that shows a highlight of the featured story elements that people click, bam, you're in the story web or the living map or the timeline. Oh and God. eventually, um, my, my project manager told me, do not give a date, Robison, or I will kill you. Oh yeah, um, no but eventually, no, right, yeah. we are working on embed codes where you can take these views and put them into your website. So if you've already got a fan site or you're an author or a game designer and you've got people coming to your site already, you can pull these Archivos displays into your website and have people be wowed and dazzled by them and play with them there. Wow. Oh, man. God damn it. This is, is really oh, I love this. Mind blown. Oh, my God. <laughs> I do. When yes, I saw this, you need to drop everything else and just work. Get this out seriously. <laughs> <laughs> no, and and so so Dave, as you know, as you're saying, this is this is what you you know you've um, you know you, you're you're happy to have people use this to develop for their games. When I start playing around with this, there's very every chance in the world that I'll be using this for, like I said, the TSR game that I want to put out. There are things in this that I was trying to figure out how I, how the fuck am I going to bring this to people? I got these great ideas of things I want to do, things I want to share, because I want this world to be like immersive. I want people to be able to just like really just jam their hands into it, right? And just feel around with it like putty. And this is the kind of tool that, that will allow me to like really let people just dig in and bury themselves in it. Well, one of the biggest initiatives that we were trying to embrace as we came up with these interfaces was, you know, when you go to a wiki, you know, if you go to, uh, uh, you know, Spelljammer wiki or whatever, the first thing you see is a wall of text and yep. your heart withers and you're going, oh, God, this is going to take a while. Right. With Archivos, the first thing you see is pictures. And if you see a pretty picture, you click on it. It's like, who's this guy? There's a paragraph of text. That's all you got to look at. Paragraph, is this somebody I'm interested in? Oh, look at the people he's connected. Oh, this guy might be interested. Let me see his full profile. But it's driven by you and your desires, your interests. And it's designed to draw people in and let them pursue their path of interest through your creative efforts. Yep. So, awesome. yeah. All visually, like visually and or in in a uh, some sort of a visual map way. And that's why I tell you what I use. The reason that, that this in instantly uh, screamed for me for the visual um, relationships was I use visual thesaurus. When I'm looking for words, I immediately yes. it's right in my bar. I subscribe to it. I pay the money per year. It is the most amazing thing when I'm just looking looking for words and I can fall at holes so looking oh my god I didn't know this word was related yeah. to this word and so I love <laughs> visual thesaurus so anyway well and go ahead Peter go ahead and call up the story web let's come back well, to hold on wait a minute real quick th this timeline thing let's go over this real quick I'm gonna I want to show okay, real quick. This, okay so so you got this timeline so down here the 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 timeline goes on it has how does this interact with with everything okay so one of the story elements that you can create is an event and you assign a date to your event, you can then create relationships to places where the event took place and the people that were involved, either the instigators or participants of that event. 
And then the timeline is designed exclusively to showcase a chronology of those events. Uh, if there's a start and an end date, then it'll be listed as a, a wider uh, rectangle taking up that much space. Each tick mark on the timeline represents uh, an increment of days or weeks or months, depending on how far you have zoomed in or zoomed out. You can pan back and see epochs, or you can zoom in and see a week or even a day, uh, because you can designate hours uh, within this thing as well. So... Uh, the idea then is you can see this chronology from, from past to future, wherever you are in the timeline. And then by clicking on one of the items in the list, you can see the summary. It shows you where it took place, who all was involved. Uh, you can see the full profile if you want to see that as well. And then you can jump from the timeline to the living map or the story web, depending on where you want to go to see more information. So, so is the living map tied to this in a way that, like, do markers appear at different times? Can you is, – is that an interaction? That sounds kind of complicated. Is that possible or uh, – Re-ask the question. I'm not sure what you're Okay, so, so for example, <laughs> it, what, can I look at the map 10 years ago or or, or is there one ah. map? Because that sounds really complicated. I don't even know how you'd pull that off if you – that, that <laughs> Yeah, really, I don't know how really we pull that off either. That, that's, we're not there yet. Right. Yeah, um, but that, that is, sounds really rough. Well, and that's a question that came up early on in the development is that, you know, uh, uh, Aragorn is listed as the owner of Narsil. But he wasn't until the third book in the trilogy. So can I list him as owner of Narsil and still reference an event that happened before he had Narsil? And uh, honestly, the, the OCD world builder in me says, mm -hmm. no, you can't do that. Uh, right. But the guy who's actually been confronted by the realities of developing software and putting it out into the public, um, yeah, actually we can and we will uh, for Ooh. at least a little bit. Um, we're hoping to find uh, uh, through beta testing, through people actually using Archivos, uh, uh, exploring new ways that we can expl uh, look at windows of time in both the living map and the timeline uh, that by assigning an epoch or an era to a story element, then you can move from one epoch, epoch or era through the story web, through the living map and through the timeline and only see characters and descriptions that are relevant to that epoch. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, you but you know, another epoch, then you get different descriptions. And you know what's going to happen with that is, is that that's just going to be a matter of how much the developer, whoever developed, like if I'm developing shit for my world, how much work I want to put into it, right? Because I would have mm -hmm. to spell all that out and everything. I may like, I might go, no, that's a little bit more than I want to do. Or, well, yeah. <laughs> and that's one of the biggest concerns that we have about Archivos is the amount of overhead, the amount yeah. of work that's going to go, have to go into setting these things up, which is why, again, I can't pin a date on it. That's for you, Chris. <laughs> Right. Um, but <laughs> one of the one of the highest one of the high priority items on our roadmap is the ability to uh, establish uh, content managers. Basically, another user of the Archivos system, you can seek them out and grant them rights mm. to mm -hmm. edit your story setting. Right. So, like a wiki. So if you, right. Yeah. If you've got yeah, like exactly yeah. like that. Yeah. You've got five super fans who are going, oh, my God, I love your shit. I would love to just type in your stuff all day long. Content manager, come on yeah, in. Ahead. Yeah, come on in. Yeah, yeah, you're good. <laughs> right. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome aboard. All right. So right. Hey, let's look. Let's look at that other one. Yeah, the oh, story sorry. web. Go ahead, Mike. This, this is oh, there, there's your visual oh. thesaurus right there. OK, there you go. Yep. Yep. That was yeah. very that was in fact, that was absolutely the inspiration. Because I'm with you. Uh, I'm okay. all over the, the visual. Oh, I, I love that thing, well. too. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, and that really was probably, now that I think about it, probably the galvanizing concept that got me started on this, uh, because, you know, that's whenever I describe this to somebody, I say, have you seen Visual Thesaurus? And if there they say yes, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Um, but you can see the idea here is there's the central character, Frodo, and then you've got orbiting him. Uh, these other individuals that are linked to him by relationships. And then you've got the tertiary individuals around them, which still doesn't show you the whole story setting. But when you double click on any one of those other dudes, 
that then becomes the center focus and everything redraws based on that new selection. So you can work your way through and find and trace all sorts of paths of interconnection through a story world. Right. Oh, dude, this oh, is, th dude, it. this this thing is fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Just, I can't and, and tell you. Dave, you know, you don't have to put everything into version one. You got to save some stuff for version two. Anyway. <laughs> right. Right? Dude, you sound like I mean, my, you sound like my project now. manager, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it must be Cadillac coming out of the garage. We cannot possibly push a Honda out. Jeez, you got to get some upgrade money out of this. Come on hey, now. Hey, what dude. is, what is it that Jack Clemens says, Jet Mike, what we always say? Better is the enemy of good. That, yes, yes. <laughs> and perfection is the enemy of done. Right, and yes. Yeah. Yes, it yes. is. Yeah. Yeah. And then you know, right off the bat, I can see the application. I know a couple guys who do walking tours of Baltimore. And how yes. great would it be if everyone could have the same points, could follow maps, could look at timelines? Like, this yes. could be such an – this could be yeah. s applied in so many ways, and not just in gaming, too, you know? Walking That's towards. inspired. Yeah. That's inspired, yeah. Jack. You're absolutely right. I had somebody come up to me at Balticon and say, you know, Ancestry.com yeah. oh, should yeah. totally plug into your story web because yeah. – now there's your legacy. There's your there's your your heritage. Your your whole family yeah. tree. What right kind there. of fucking narcissist do you have to be if you set up one of these about yourself though? Seriously, <laughs> if you had yourself and all your friends orbiting and like, here's where I ate a, a steak sandwich. Here's where I had Chipotle. You know what I mean? Like right. if you if you were that big of a narcissist, this tool would really it put you over the edge. Have you, been on, <laughs> have you been on Facebook recently, Jeff? Yeah, I yeah, know, yeah. right? <laughs> can you link this? You should have it so it can link to your Facebook. Oh, that, yeah. That's totally. Uh, totally. Dude. Well, here, I will, give you, I will give you one indication of the upsell uh, that we're moving towards. And, and project manager, if you're listening, this isn't even on the phase one map. We're talking way in the future. But you're looking at the story web, for example. And you're a user. You're looking at uh, you're looking at Jim Butcher's Dresden Files is laid up in here, and you see next to one of the uh, characters, you see a little gray circle that's just sitting there floating in space, saying, "Add your character to this world." Yeah. And now you, as the user, can add user generated content to an established story world. Oh, and if right. you were to say, write a short story that involved that new character and this other dude who's a part of the canon and uploaded that to the setting, that could be linked to those profiles. So that if anybody calls up your character, they can see in the sidebar, oh, hey, look, here's a little fiction written by, I want to read that thing. Or maybe you did an audio narration of somebody else's short story. Let's upload that thing. Full moon. I'm, I'm totally going out there at this point but a true true collaboration uh, uh between storyteller and and fans and users yeah, but everybody Dave, becomes a story think teller. about this i mean as, as this is the inspiration to get people to do this and, and to be part of this you know i'm gonna stop sharing the screen so real quick i think we, we've seen it all right we've seen all we've seen it yeah all, that's pretty much all. that's pretty much the, right. the three pillars of arc of us so as running games, so so as, as a game master or, or you know, a, a, sto a, a gaming world a storyteller, think about this. People start uploading their characters and events and stuff like that. And you can use them or not use them. That would be sort of like the public, you know, uh, living world or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So I'm a game master. I'm running. I got my guys, they, 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 a team of guys, and they come into this town. And I'm like, hmm, what's going on in this town? So I could click on that town. I can see what all the other game masters are doing in that town. And I might go, oh, there's a group of Hellions in here. That I think I'm gonna have my players meet, right? And you just wholesale take that other group of players, right, and use them or the bar that they went to and the story that they told. And it could be something that you heard. Oh, you heard about? Uh, yeah, you heard about a robbery at at, at the uh, at the bank. Uh, you you know they're offering a reward to chase these guys down. Well, that was the other adventurers. They've already left town. However. Right. Now you go chase them, and that's your adventure. And it doesn't affect them at all. Yes, exactly. Right? You can pick up the story where one adventure leaves off. Absolutely. Yeah, dude. God, this, God damn it. This is great. <laughs> right? I know. Yeah, right? Yeah, this is awesome. So, so look, yeah, I, I, I have, uh, I know time's ticking down. I, I have something that I want to share with your listeners. Yes, go ahead. Please do sure. Um, so here's here's the release cycle for Archivos. 
uh, we're planning on launching what we call a closed beta on September 1st. Uh, and this is basically a, we're still in beta, but it's sexy. It's so very sexy. Uh, and we want to create this sort of invested community. So for a modest fee, uh, uh, you can come in and play in Archivos uh, for a few months. The actual full public launch happens January 1st, 2018. But September 1st, we're going to open it up. People that want to get involved, modest fee, you're in. At Gen Con, we're going to do that uh, ahead of time. We're going to do like a pre-opening with special discounts for anybody at Gen Con. However, between now and Gen Con, we find ourselves in a situation where we need more beta testers. We need people to come in and kick the tires and give us feedback. And that's the input. That's the thing. It's not just, wow, I want to play with all this, but we need to know your impressions. We need to know your ideas. We need to get your feedback on this. We need. Are you listening? Are you listening, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> Sean's in our chat room. We need people to play <laughs> in Archivos while, and I will tell you right now, all this stuff that you're seeing here, it ain't there yet. We're working on it. It's so close. Um, we just now rolled out the first iteration of StoryWeb, and it's gorgeous, but it's also a bit buggy. Um, we're going to launch uh, Living Map probably in the next couple of weeks, and then Timeline a couple of weeks after that. And we need we need beta testers to play in that. If this sounds like something you would be down with, if this if getting in on the true, and I'm telling you, this is so the ground floor. It is ugly, it's dirty, and we want you to talk about it. Um, but if that <laughs> sounds like something you're down with on Wednesday at archivos.digital, a page will go up, the call is going to go out and you will be given the opportunity to submit an application to be a beta tester for Archivos. And at this first opening stage, you're a very special kind of angel to me and to our development team. Uh, you will be treated most, most graciously uh, as Archivos advances forward. I don't know if that means you're gonna have a special badge on your profile when we have profiles on Archivos, but trust me, beta testers will be loved uh, uh, in ways that will make you probably uncomfortable, but also uh, <laughs> make you feel good inside. So there you go. Okay, Archivos.digital. Look for it, and you will find a form that you can fill out to submit to be considered as a beta tester. Fucking awesome, awesome! I'm being, I'm there Wednesday. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. I know our group, our group could use this. We would like it. Yes, like definitely. It. Excellent. I will. I will look forward to your feedback. And again, I cannot emphasize enough that this is the reason it's not out yet is because it's not ready to be out yet. It's right. there's stuff that works and stuff that doesn't. There's stuff that hasn't worked for months. But because the way development, software development works is you work on the high priority items first yeah. and you worry about the low priority items later. That's just the way it works. Uh, so these items, while, gee, it's so simple. Why don't you do that? Well, it's because we were creating something from scratch over here. <laughs> and that kind of took our attention. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so. Building the foundation of the house is the hardest part. It's not the sexiest That's part, right. but you know, right. That's so, right. Yeah, we're not putting up the siding yet. We haven't put in the granite countertops. <laughs> You're still looking at drywall, baby. Yeah. Right. Right. Absolutely. All right. Well, that's Archivos, and and we're all excited. I fuck yeah. Um, oof, I don't know. That is yes. that is amazing. So, real quick, let's because because we're running out of time very fast. Uh, I just want to touch on a couple more things uh, because they are important to what you do and the things that you've been doing and currently doing. Uh, you have a board game, Manifest Game, right? Yes. Uh, real quick, correct. give me the elevator pitch. What's Manifest Game? All right. The Manifest Game, as, as you described earlier, combines the positional strategy and nuance of chess with the fantastical diversity of Magic the Gathering. Uh, basically, players are invited to manifest pieces onto the playing board, harvest resources that allow them to bring on more powerful pieces, pieces like the Mobian, who can wrap the edges of the game board from one side to the other. Uh, the dragon, who is the most deadliest pieces we found during playtesting, with, with, in one move, the dragon can kill four other pieces. It's Ooh, devastating. Wow. Uh, there is, um, oh geez, the Shadow Walker, 
who can go from one aspect of sex and teleport to another and then strike and then fade into the shadows. Over 50 different vessels that can be manifested onto the game board, all with the objective of gathering the precious essence, the source, and healing the rift that has created this arena where these vessels can do battle. And whoever does so, whoever moves enough source into the rift, will become for a brief moment a god and be able to rewrite a piece of reality. That's right, so, manifest. So, so you see how Dave is telling this story. So Dave is going to Gen Con. I know that because you're doing a release at Gen Con, right? You have to be going there. Yep. Go to Gen Con and play Manifest because it sounds like it'll be 10 times better with Dave. Yeah, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> you know, right? No, it sounds really cool. It sounds really, really cool, but it sounds even cooler if you're running it. <laughs> Thanks, brother. So what, what is the format? Explain the format. How will this? If if we're not going to be at Gen Con, what do we? If we sat down, what are we going to see? What? How will we experience um, this? If you if you go to uh, on Facebook, if you go to Manifest Game, facebook.com slash Manifest Game, okay. uh, there's the Facebook page for Manifest. What we're looking to do, it's basically it's a hexagonal board. There are six manifestation hexes around it. Everybody starts off with these basic harvester pieces. And then they move onto the board and harvest pieces. And then each of those manifestation hexes becomes an entry point for any of your pieces that you choose to bring on. So. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So, so. Dave, uh, again, before, before we go, we got a couple more things to touch on. Uh, you do uh, podcasting, audio fiction. Uh, you have the round table podcast. What is the round table podcast real quick? Very cool. The Roundtable Podcast, I'm glad you brought that up, Peter. Uh, uh, it's basically an opportunity for young writers to come onto the show and pitch a story idea to a veteran author or, or editor of the industry. And then all of us sit around and we brainstorm the idea for about 45 minutes, trying to transform the raw idea into literary gold. Okay. Uh, now... With Roundtable, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up, Peter. Um, Roundtable's been on hiatus because, damn, I've been a bit busy yeah. <laughs> for the last few months. Right. Um, I'm firing it up again in July, but I'm rebranding it. The Roundtable podcast, same awesomeness, same structure, same format, is now going to be called the Archivos Brainstorm podcast. Oh, oh. Yeah, I see what All you're doing the there, yeah. And every guest writer and every guest host that comes onto the show gets a free year subscription to Archivos. Brought to you by Archivos. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, that's fantastic. All right. Uh, great, great. Uh, and just, I just want to touch on a couple more things real quick. Uh, so you do narr- – I'm not even going to go. I'm just going to read this. You go into – you do narration for audio books. You've uh, done Scavenger Evolution Sand Divers. Suave Rob's Double X Derringer Do, uh, Psychedelic 40 and Barry World, all on Amazon and Audible. Um, this voice that you're hearing, you can hear in your ears for what, eight, six, 10, 12 hours that I go. Um, you also did, uh, you were a co writer on True, Com- True Crime Comics number one. Uh, your company is Wonder Thing Studio. Uh, there's a link down here. Go to that. Just look down here. Go to Wonder Thing Studio. It has all his stuff, all the Dave stuff that he does. Uh, and I'm going to give the link in a second. Uh, and then you have Vex. Now, just touching this real quick again, elevator pitch Vex Mosaic. Right. Vex Mosaic is an online magazine. It's the magazine of speculative thought. Uh, The idea behind Vex Mosaic is that as geeks, as nerds, our passions and our interests uh, uh, elevate our, our engagement with the film, the comics, the books, the art that drives fandom. Uh, That leads to revelations. That leads to insights and awareness. We find new ways for our nerddom and geekdom to interact with culture and society. Vex Mosaic is a place for essays and treatises and tracts about how fandom and geekery and nerdery intersects, influences, and transforms culture and society. Wow. Fantastic. All That's right. A great topic. That's- Charlie Brown is the uh, the managing editor for that. I'm the editor in chief. Uh, we just launched a, a, a podcast, uh, The Bigger Picture. Uh, episode one is up. We recorded another one at Balticon, uh, The Trouble with Iron Fist. That was a great panel discussion. Yeah. Uh, that'll be coming out in the next week or two on the, the Vex Mosaic feed. And Charlie Brown. We met Charlie Brown, right, Mike? He's a great guy. I love Charlie Brown. Yeah, he's Charlie Brown's awesome. He is. 
Uh, and then and la- and let's get on to just the last thing. Uh, and, and again, this will be just really quick. Uh, you you work with the Ed Greenwood Group, and Ed Greenwood was on our show. Uh, Go back to yes. season three, episode thirteen. We interviewed Ed. Ed, Ed was awesome. He uh, was what, amazing. Real quick, what are you Ed, doing? Ed with- is an experience. Ed is a force of nature. He is. Uh, they're they're just being in his presence, even virtually online, because we had him on the roundtable too. Is is phenomenal. And yes, it was amazing to be a part of the Ed Greenwood group and help them shape their first uh, uh, initial efforts in this grand, epic, massive, collaborative world, shared world transmedia experience that they're building over there. I've kind of, because of Archivos, because of Manifest, I've had to step back, scale back some of my associations with them. Uh, uh, But that doesn't change the fact that they are an astonishing group of individuals. I met some amazing creatives there. Uh, and you can too. Engaging with that group is is awesome. Yeah, and if you, if you go back to that episode, so again, season three, episode thirteen, we talked to Ed about all that, the stuff that Dave is talking about. This yep. vast world of all these novels and and different. Oh my God, it's it's fucking it's unbelievable. The 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 you know the 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 rabbit hole you could go down with all the books that he's talking about writing. I was just like, I oh, can't, yeah. Ed, really? And um, <laughs> but yeah, he's he's something. It's a multifaceted a jewel, that man. He can yes, crank he him out. Right. He can. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give out links. Dave, thank you. God damn it, thank you for joining us. This archivist yes. is is oh my god, it's it's even better than I thought it was gonna be. So <laughs> check out Wonder Things Studio or Wonder Things, sorry, Wonder Thing Studios dot com. Uh, you can also go to Facebook.com, Wonder Thing Studios. Uh, on Twitter at Wonder Things, but it's it's like you know it's like a rap name. It's Wonder Things with a Z, right? So, so things. Yeah. What's up? Uh, there's a, obviously you can go to Ar- Archivos. So it's A R C H I V O S dot digital, not dot com dot digital. Right. Uh, check out the and, now. Is Roundtable Podcast? Is that gonna that's gonna that name's gonna change, right? Um, I'm gonna keep it a Roundtable Podcast. I think I think just from a brand and an expectation yeah. thing. Changing that would be catastrophic. Yeah, okay. um, it's always going to be the Roundtable Podcast, and everybody, any, anybody that listened to it now, is going to know that even if I call it the Archivos Roundtable or Archivos Brainstorms, it's still right. a Roundtable. Okay, right. um, fantastic. So just, you're going to rebrand it, repolish it, redo the site, and so on, right. and link to it from the Archivos site. But yeah, RoundtablePodcast.com will always get you there. Brought right. to you by Archivos. Right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and and uh, Vex, V-E-X-M-O-S-A-I-C.com. And then, of course, the last link I'm going to give out is Facebook.com forward slash Manifest Game. And I think that gets you to everything that Dave does. Uh, as you can tell, Holy he's crap. a busy fucking dude, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are. All right, so hey, yeah, Mike. Fact, is, uh, is, just real quick, quick shout out to yep. Scott Roche. Uh, I just yes. finished oh, yeah. voicing his uh, Esho St. Clair uh, Case Files uh, novel, the first audio book in the Case Files of Esho St. Clair. Uh, that's going to be coming out probably in the next couple of weeks, and it was a blast. Awesome. I, got, I got to be all British. I got to be Irish. I got to be uh, uh, Russian. I got to be demonic. I got to be draconic. I just had a blast. It was awesome. Hey, you didn't get to be bar moron, though. (laughs) No, I didn't. didn't. It's true. I didn't. I wanted to, but I didn't. (laughs) Hey, Mike, uh, so for this closing, is uh, is that thing that we were talking about? I'll queue it up. I'll queue it up. Ready to go, buddy. All right, fantastic. All right, Dave, thank you so much for being on the show. Yes, thank you, Dave. Thank you. This has been a blast. I greatly appreciate it, and I've had a blast. You are always welcome back, especially once this goes live and you get everything all hammered out and and you're like, want to talk about it some more, come back. Okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely awesome. Welcome. All cool. right, everybody. You have just enjoyed another awesome episode of the Mythwits Podcast. Catch us live on Twitch Mondays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Jump into the chat room and ask our guests questions just like some of the people that were in there right mike um (laughs) sean i believe was in there uh sean yes sean uh and and mega gold and mega gold right 
that's yes. If you miss our live show, you can always catch the encore episodes at YouTube forward slash Mythwits. This will be up there tomorrow or the next day, probably tomorrow because I got some time tonight. You can also find us at Mythwits.com and on Facebook, Twitter, and SoundCloud as the Mythwits. You can, dude, just. Go to your podcatcher, type in Mythwits. <laughs> you can listen to us. It's fantastic. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate. Please give us a bunch of stars and reviews on iTunes because that's important, yo. Screenshot yeah. it. Post it on our Facebook page and I'll personally send you something. I will send you, I don't know, uh, one of the, the Chotskys from Mama Marsh's house. Um, <laughs> Mythwits <laughs> is part of the TSR Podcast Network. If you like us, you're bound to like the other great stuff there as well. Check out TSRPN.com. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Make sure to check out 217.com for more cool stuff. Join our mailing list, please. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next week... You're supposed to say Mama Marsh. Mama Dummy. Marsh? This is Mama Geek Squad Marsh saying Mythwits rocks. Yes! <laughs> <laughs>